We just had the most divisive election uh, since 1860, and there was just about zero violence leading up to the election. There was essentially zero violence on election day. There's been just a little bit of violence afterwards. I don't think anybody has been killed. Um, at, but my point is, the democracy in America, while it's sick in many ways, it actually worked. The voting was honest. I mean, there were observers coming to make sure that, you know, <laughs> like, you know are we a banana republic, as, as many people uh, are now saying? Uh, but we all behaved actually pretty civilly, not in our discourse necessarily, but in terms of violence, there was essentially none. Um, and ultimately what happened, there was, a, there was a really beautiful column by the conservative columnist Peggy Noonan, um, in which she, uh, she pointed out that, um, um, that there's actually something kind of beautiful about what happened, that um, th Trump had no ground game, no real research, he was a mess, it was a terrible campaign, nobody called the voters, nobody drove them to the polls. He won because people were sick of what was going on and they chose to go themselves. And the election was won by basically a dispossessed, a very large group of people who nobody's been speaking for, who a lot of people have been speaking down to. Um, and they, it, whether you like it or not, it, it actually was a demonstration of democracy in action. Now, for the bad news, um, the bad news, I mean, much, you know, uh, uh, I, I, don't think that Donald Trump has the temperament to be president. I'm concerned about many things. Um, um, but what I'm most concerned about as a social psychologist who studies political civility is that things were getting really bad in terms of our ability to listen to each other and trust each other before. And now, if you can just imagine what it was like <clears throat> for the left to believe that it was on the verge of demographic eternity, like this is it. You know, the Republicans will never win again. And the only question on all of our minds was, how big will the victory be? Will, will the Democrats take the Senate? They might, could they take the House? It's possible. And so to go from that, <clears throat> and my wife and I were with some neighbors on election day evening. The New York Times had this incredible meter that showed you the exact odds at every second given every bit of information. And it was eight, you know, 70%, 80%, 70%, 80%. And everybody, you know, it, it, there was an, a mood across the whole nation on the left. And then you can, what, you can imagine what it felt like for those needles to dip to 50 and, be going, and then they dip to, uh, and, and so you can understand why um, people on the left, it, it, so my report from America, it is the zombie apocalypse. If you walk <laughs> around there, you will see people in a daze. They have no idea what has happened, but they know it's really bad and they w want to kill someone. Um, so that's my report from America. Nick, over to you. <laughs> So, I mean, the way that I think about populism and democracy, populism is like the sword of Damocles hanging over the politicians. Populism is a problem because it's really, really hard to make good economic policy, and it, when populists have influenced that economic policy, is usually much, much worse. Just ask Argentina and compare it to Singapore or Sweden. So, populism is, I think, a bad thing uh, in terms of governance and uh, economic policy, but it's a very, very good thing in terms of there being a sort of Damocles, there being an in case of emergency and massive dissatisfaction, break glass, let the demons out. We don't want the demons to come out, but if politics, if politi and you say this very well in your book, it's something about liberal, the essence of it is holding politics to account. If politicians are not, don't have the threat of people saying, no, I hate this, then it can go much, much worse. So we're not here to say populists are bad. I think we're here to say, what went so wrong that there's an angry populist backlash, which we both understand and even to a large extent empathize with? And how can we avoid this happening in the future? How can we get better politics? So I, I think, again, we're very much on the same page there. I've been reading about the history of capitalism and what happens when nations adopt free market policies. And what happens is wealth goes skyrocketing upwards. And it's not just that the rich get richer, it's that everybody gets richer. And then, a generation or two later, everyone gets rights. And so, that's why in the long run, the world's getting better and better and better. And if we were having this conversation two years ago, I would very much agree with my libertarian friends who say, look, I mean, in the broad sweep of history, it's amazing how good everything is, what's amazing, what's happening. But there are some interesting paradoxes, there are some interesting ways in which the progress of a free market society creates conditions that undermine either the progress of a free market society or democratic capitalism. And so here's, here's the main one I want to put out here for our discussion. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time 
reading the work of the, the psychologists and sociologists who create the World Value Survey. They survey, it started in Europe, now it's global, uh, every seven years, that you can see this, these beautiful maps showing the whole world and where they are on this two-dimensional value space. And so Sweden and Scandinavia in the upper right, that means they have, their values are the most, um, uh, it's, a, it's a, like freedom-loving, uh, emancipative, that's the word, Emancipa freedom or emancipative values, and they're the most secular rational, so that's Sweden. And then the bottom left, from my perspective here, bottom left is like uh, mostly African and Islamic countries that still have the values appropriate to an agricultural society that has no trust in government, that has no faith that there will be food six months from now. So it's very, very different sets of values. As countries get wealthy, they move up and then to the right. They move to that zone where Scandinavia is now. And that's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing. What happens is then everyone's values change. In the next generation, they really begin to care a lot more about women's rights, gay rights, animal rights, human rights, the environment. So you get this very progressive shift in values. Okay, so with this sort of audience, I'm sure that all sounds great. So that's step one. But here's step two. Once you have these incredibly prosperous, peaceful, progressive societies, they do, the people there begin to do a few things. Um, first of all, it's not everybody who has those values. It's everybody in the capital city and the university towns. They all have these values. They're, so if you look at our countries, you know, in America, we're like pretty retrograde in some ways, but if you look at our, those, our bubble places, they're just like Sweden. And that means that these people now think that, you know, nation states, they're so arbitrary. And, you know, just, I mean, just imagine, imagine if there were no countries. It isn't hard to do, <laughs> you know? Imagine if there was nothing, nothing to kill or die for. No <laughs> religion too. So this is, this is the way the values shift. And when, so this is what I and others are calling the global, it's like the new left-right is like the globalists and, versus the nationalists. And so the globalist ethos is tear down the walls, tear down the borders, nation states are arbitrary. Why, you know, why should my government privilege the people who happen to be born here rather than people who are much poorer elsewhere? And so you get this globalist idea, you begin to get even a denial of patriotism. Uh, the claim, uh, there's some hor uh, horrible, there's some pictures going around uh, right-wing media now in the United States, protesters, anti-Trump protesters holding up signs that say patriotism is racism. So you get people acting in this globalist way, inviting immigration, spitting on the nation state spitting on the country and people who are patriotic um, and uh, very opposed to assimilation when there is integration because that as we say in america on the people on the left would say that's cultural genocide so this is step two is you get um, wealthy wonderful successful societies that are so attractive to poor people around the world you get a flood of immigration and they're met by the globalists who say welcome 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 don't assimilate because that would we don't want to deny you your culture and this leads to step three which is, this triggers an incredible emotional reaction in people who have the psychological type known as authoritarianism. Now, it's a very negative term, um, but there's a lot of psychological diversity in this world. There are some people who are attracted to the Leninist vision, the, the John Lennon vision. There are other people who are more parochial, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, there are people who really care about hearth and home and God and country, and um, they are actually friends of, of order and stability, and they can, they're friends of many good things about civic life, but when they perceive that everybody's coming apart, the moral world is coming apart, that's when they get really racist, homophobic, uh, they want to clamp down, they want to restore moral order, and if anybody here saw Donald Trump's acceptance speech at the Republican National Committee, that's exactly what he said. He modeled himself after Richard Nixon's 1968 speech, a time when cities are burning, there are riots, and Nixon came in, law and order will be restored, and that's basically what Trump's whole speech was. So what I'm saying is, successful democratic capitalist societies create, the, they change values, they generate wealth, they invite people in, and then they make some of the people act in ways that trigger the other people to be furious, and those other people actually have a point because you have to have trust in social capital to have a redistributive welfare state. Mm -hmm. This is getting a little too complicated. My point is just that, yes, the economy matters, and economic changes matter, but they matter in ways that always run through psychology, mm -hmm. um, is you have to look at politics, I think, by looking for the sacred values of each group. So we evolved, human nature evolved for tribalism and religion, small-scale religion of tribes. And that was the way we lived for the last 100,000 years with roots going much further back than that. Um, 
And so what we're really good at is putting up something, it could be a tree or a river or an ancestor, and then we circle around it, and then we can actually all trust each other. And this is, this is one of the main social, evolutionary innovations of human nature, is we have the ability to make something sacred, we circle around it, we all worship it, and then we can go fight others, and we are the descendants of people who were able to do that. So that's tribalism. Now, in politics, always look for what each side makes sacred. And for anybody who remembers World War II, certainly in Britain and America, the country, the flag, and then freedom, democracy, all these other virtues, and we'll, I hope we'll talk about universities in a bit, but the idea of freedom, liberty, and then after World War II, fighting the communists, so the idea of freedom, 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 liberty, so it was a good time to be a liberal. Liberal meant liberty, freedom, fighting for liberty. So there are, the older generation has those values from circling around during the war and afterwards, but then we get the new left in the 1960s, we get the fall of the Berlin Wall in the 1990s, in 1989 and then into the 90s, um, and we get a rise, and because I teach at a university, I'm surrounded by it, so we get a rise of a new set of sacred values around racism, sexism, oppression, and basically the sacred victim. Mm -hmm. And this is the clash, this is part of the clash. If you have a group, if you have groups on the left whose essentially their religion is fighting racism, well, that's a very admirable thing to do, but if you, it becomes a religion, you become fundamentalist, now everything that contradicts that must fall. So just to give a very vivid example, uh, I taught at uh, the University of Virginia for 16 years. Uh, my, my children were born there, I love UVA. Um, and at UVA, we all worship Thomas Jefferson. He was the founder of our university, obviously the writer of the Declaration of Independence. Um, so we worship Thomas Jefferson, and every president who ever of the university who writes something always quotes Thomas Jefferson. Well, all university presidents had to write to their students a day or two afterwards because the students are freaking out, uh, thinking that it's the end of the world, that they're going to be murdered in their sleep by Trumpists. Um, so every university president has to write to the student body to say something without being too political, but acknowledging the pain and trauma. And so the president of UVA um, quotes Thomas Jefferson. Well, um, some professors, uh, joined by some students, write a, an open letter to the president saying, stop quoting Jefferson. Jefferson was a racist, a slave owner, and a rapist. If you quote Thomas Jefferson at a time like this, you are dividing us. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is as sacrilegious as could be. This is like going to church and saying, stop quoting Jesus, okay? <laughs> What do you think the parishioners are going to do? So the alumni are furious at this. Mm -hmm. But my point is, it is like a new religion. And so, but every, every political movement is like a religion. So to bring it back to immigration, the new religion, one of the new religions, is all about diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Now you've got immigrants coming in. My God, we all saw those, the horrible photos of children dying. Of course you feel sympathy. What do you do about it? Well, if it's your central religion, then of course you welcome them. And if anybody says, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're linked to terrorism, they're, they're mm. forcing us to change our way. If anybody says that, they're a racist. So you have the dawn of this new religion, which in my view is extremely illiberal. Mm. And this is one of the things I loved about your book, is that I stopped calling myself a liberal back in, in the American sense, because we butchered the word, we mm. made it mean left. Uh, that was wrong. We made it 100 years ago, liberal meant left. And I was a liberal my whole life until I basically finished The Righteous Mind and I realized, you know, I gave, I gave a chapter to my wife to, to read and, and after explaining the conservative worldview, I said to her, Jane, I don't think I can call myself a liberal anymore, meaning on the left. Because this new illiberal left, I, I mm. think is, is, you can't have a functioning multi-ethnic society if you have this kind, mm. of, kind of attitude. So that's the clash we have now over immigration is if it's a if central, basically a religious battleground. Mm. So, so I, I see two problems in that way of thinking that I see all the time on the left. The first is to start with an economic analysis and to say, well, why are they voting against their interest? And many people on the left don't get, because they are globalists, they don't get that the idea of the nation is something sacred. Um, they don't get that, they don't get ideas of patriotism. So that's the first thing is to focus on economic analysis. Um, and uh, the second is to act as though the community is just local, because again, they don't get the nation. So, um, so I often am told, and whenever I talk about immigration, I get exactly what you said. Well, why is it that the areas with mm. the most immigrants are the most tolerant? Therefore, if we just flood the zone, flood every <laughs> town with immigrants, they'll all get tolerant. Okay, now it's obviously not going to work, in part because we have in America, and I'm sure in Britain too, people move where they feel comfortable. And so people who have a globalist, John Lennon-type brain, if they're born in central Kansas, they're going to get to Chicago as fast as they can, as soon as they can leave home. And then they'll get to New York or London, and vice versa. So people are sorting into mm. the kinds of places but that they feel comfortable. But they've always done that. 
And much oh, more I now. No, no, no. For now. Much more now. Now, we, because now people, we have the luxury of choosing our lifestyle. Mm. It, 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 life wasn't that easy. Where you could just choose. Mm. What, you know. So, so much more now. We have assortative moving. Um, and the other thing is, is you know, after 9/11 happened, and, and the people, you know, the people in New York and Washington, or in New York especially, were not all gung ho for war. And I remember some of them saying, "Why are the people out in the red areas? Why are they so upset about this? They weren't even attacked." as though the 9-11 attack happened to New York City and Washington, D.C., mm, not mm, the mm. biggest collective trauma to the United States since 1941. Mm, mm. And so there's a kind of a blindness I see over and over again mm. on the left where they approach things in economic terms. It really is like a color blindness, like they're missing receptors. And I think this is very much a problem with the, the leaders of the European Union mm. and those who want ever closer union. I think they're, what they're missing, what they're missing is you can have diversity within a shared sense of identity. Mm. And if you don't have that shared sense of identity, it's going to be very divisive. I want to give you just a beautiful example I heard today. Um, I spent two hours today at the Open Society Foundation, a Soros-funded group of people very concerned about immigration. And we, ta you know, we talked all about the, the issues with assimilation. And afterwards, one told me um, about a project that, that he did. They, at the Queen's Jubilee, was it the 60th anniversary of at the Queen's Jubilee, there was a, I think it was a, a refugee jubilee party. And it was uh, all of these refugees mm. who were celebrating the Queen and, and how great it is to be, Brit to be in Britain, to be. So that's the sort of thing that I'm even just hearing about, like as an American, that really just like I got all choked up just hearing about it. Um, because that really, that was, it was the same thing as we saw at the Democratic Convention when Kaiser Khan, the Pakistani immigrant um, whose son was killed in the mm. US Army, uh, when he spoke, you know, actually I can't even quote it because I'll get, I'll, I'll start choking up on stage, but um, basically saying that he, he, he stands there with, uh, un, uh, as a patriotic American Muslim with undivided loyalty for his country. And see, I'm, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> this is an, it's an American reflex. You're right. Um, Populism has to be given a chance to succeed or fail because uh, if, you know, if, if, it, if things turn out very badly for Britain or the United States, then there would at least be, there would be an openness to trying something different and to re returning to new ideas about liberalism, which I hope the left will be reinventing in its think tanks as it licks its wounds all over the, all over the Western world and comes out with a much more appealing version of liberalism um, that is not based on identity and identity politics. And that does, and this is what I, again, there's a theme throughout your book, is the need for conversation, the need for debate, the need to challenge. Um, I, uh, I used to always say my favorite philosopher was David Hume, but now it's John Stuart Mill. Um, in oh, you liberty. are a liberal after all then, yeah. yeah. I, I, that's right, I, I, as soon as I cross the Atlantic, <laughs> I'm a liberal. Um, uh, John Stuart Mill, one of his, one of his lines, it's my favorite, is he says, he who knows only his own side of the case mm. knows little of that. And this is what I think we need to understand about ourselves. Human nature, um, human nature is, in, is, is really unsuited for life in large multi-ethnic democracies. We're a tribal, we're a small tribal living primate. And somehow we've created conditions where we can actually do it pretty well. But we have to always be vigilant. We can't take it for granted. That's what mm. we've done, I think. Mm. We have to be always vigilant that we're in a way living above our design constraints. And I think we need to recognize this is the urgent need of the 21st century is to really think through democracy, governance, and, and morality. In America, we have three giant divides, race, class, and left-right. Mm. One of them has been getting steadily better over the last 40 years. Two have been getting worse. And the left is entirely focused on the one that gets better, which is race. It is decade after decade, it gets better and better. And our class divide gets worse and worse, and our political divide is getting worse and worse. What's going to do us in, even though things look tense racially right now, what's going to do us in is I ultimately, well, it's the populism is in part the class divide, but what's really going to do us in is that we're losing the ability to have a democracy when the political divide is so full of fury. Mm -hmm. So the final causal factor I'll put in here in our discussion, and we'll throw it open, is um, we've mentioned social media a little bit. I've only really come to appreciate the incredible power of social media to activate all of our tribal sentiments in ways that make democracy unlikely. Because I follow a lot of people on Twitter, I now see these incredible outrages. Mm. It, it used to be, when I was growing up, like once a month, there'd be a new story about the terrible things the Republicans did. And we could all talk about how terrible Republicans are. Um, and now, whichever side you're on, there's five an hour. Because <laughs> any, you know, if a swastika is drawn on a locker in a junior high school in Illinois, mm. everybody on the left will hear about it. Mm. 
And if an idiot holds up a sign saying patriotism is racism anywhere in America, uh, everyone on the right will hear about it. Mm. And so everyone is immersed in a river of outrage. And it's very hard to see how we turn down the volume. Mm. So I think the very idea of democracy is being severely challenged by new technology, by high levels of immigration without assimilation, although I think immigration with assimilation could work quite, quite well. So I think we have our work cut out for us, mm -hmm. and, and we really need to, and, I, and again, I think the, a, a broadly liberal framework, drawing from the hundreds of years of liberal tradition, I think is the best framework for us to start the discussion mm -hmm. in.